History and Geography, two of the subject students may decide to study for a group of 40 students. The following is known. Now, this is one of the easiest situations we're going to start with, okay, where you can literally number out things, um, but there's different challenges. They tell you how many students study neither of them. They tell you how many study, students study each of them, history and geography individually. Okay, part A. Students chosen at random, but who's the event diagram or otherwise find the probability that the student studies both history and geography. How gentle of them to give us a solution path. Okay, so let's write part A. They've suggested, because it's generally the best way to do it in situations like this. Um, there is another way to do this, by the way, without a Venn diagram, which we'll talk about in a minute. But let's go ahead and draw. This is our entire sample space here. And given what you know, because I don't want you to just jump into start drawing circles, okay? which is the first thing that most students will do, have a read of the question of how many students are doing history, geography, etc. What do you think the circles are doing? Because in a Venn diagram, there's many combinations, right? You can have two separate circles. You can have one circle inside of the other. You can have the overlapping situation. Which one is this? Have a look at the numbers. Hmm. Any hey, takers, what do you recommend? It's the overlapping circles. Overlapping? Let's go ahead and draw the overlapping circles. You are right, but I'm going to go to someone else. Does anyone give me a clue? as to why we know they're overlapping. Here is the information. You've got seven students. You might want to jot this down since you can't see it. You study neither. Did I bring my adapter with me? I did not. Sorry about that. I would have put it up on the screen, but can't. Seven students study neither. 20 students study history. And I think it's 18. Yep. 18 students study geography. And then I've got 40 in total. OK. Let's start again. Uh, now you'll see why you're like, isn't it obvious that there was an overlap? No, it is not obvious there's an overlap in this one. Um, the piece of information you were going off, by the way, which is useful if you get given it, is that if there are students who study both, then bam, I've got an overlap. Like that's the easiest case, okay? However, look carefully at the numbers, think about what each of them represent. You can infer that there must be an overlap if you look carefully at the numbers. Hmm. What do you think? The total is more than 40. Okay, so let's have a look at this total, right? If I look at all these numbers here, and it's important that we don't just, um, like, why are we adding up numbers? We're adding up numbers because this should be everyone, right? Studying history, studying geography, or you're not studying either. That should capture the whole class, right? But when you add up uh, 7 and 18, that's 25. So you add 20, you get 45. I've got more students than I'm supposed to have. So that tells you there has to be students who are counted twice. That's what it means to have overlap, yeah? 45, so can someone tell me what the overlap is? It's five, cool. That actually is part A, by the way. Um, a student is chosen at random. Find the probability that a student studies both. This is the key to answering this question. Before we do that, though, I've started doing this Venn diagram. Why don't we actually finish it, right? We'll put history over here and geography over here. Always essential that you label your Venn diagram so you know what it's talking about. Can we fill in the rest of the numbers? Where did these go into our Venn diagram? I'm going to look to one, two, three of you to give me three pieces of information. What do you reckon? I'll pause you because you gave me a great answer before. There's a lot of you who haven't given me anything this morning. This is an easy one. Come on, help me out. Yeah. History is 15. Okay, let's think about where we've got that. There are 20 in total in history. I've already counted five of them. So there's 15. You're off the hook. Well done. <laughs> Someone give me another one that's just as easy. Yeah. Geography's 13. Geography's 13. Same logic, right? These are the ones who haven't yet been double counted. And actually, the last one is the easiest of all. You can tell me all out loud. How many out here? Seven, Seven right? These are the ones who study neither. And you can go ahead and cross check, right? All of these things, do they add up to 40? Thumbs up. OK. So. Probability of a random student studying both. This is our favorable events over 40 for our sample space. And I'm just, I mean, I know you can write that as 1 over 8, but I'm just going to leave that because that's it. Yeah? All right, that was part A. Now, sorry, because you can't see part B, let me read it for you. And I'll read it twice so you catch all the information, right? Students chosen at random. Given that the student studies geography, what's the probability that the student doesn't study history? 
I'll repeat that one more time. Given that the student studies geography, what is the probability that the student does not study history? Okay, now, before anyone jumps out and answer with me, right? I want to figure out how do we write this down? The probability known that the student studies geography, what's the probability that they don't study history? So what are our A and our B in this case? We'll start with A because we're going to write that down first. No history, right? So here is our favorable event. This is the thing I'm actually interested in happening. And the condition, what's the thing we know about this student? They're a geography student. Happy times. OK. So one of the nice things about having laid it out like this is that each of the pieces that you want are sitting there on the surface of the Venn diagram, right? I actually usually start with the sample space, right? Because like that's the whole thing, and then you can go further down from there, and you can narrow it down. So this is our new reduced sample space, which is 18 students. Which of these 18 don't study history? 13. The diagram does all the work for you, yeah? You can already see where we got that from, and we just added in this reduced sample space. OK, final question on here. <clears throat> I'll read it again twice for you just so you catch all the details. And this time, as I read it, I want you to think again, how are we writing this thing? Because the way that you notate it, the way that you communicate what's going on, it's a lot more than just give me this number, right? That's super important. Part two. Two different students chosen at random, one after the other. So now we're looking at a multi-stage event. What's the probability that the first student studies history and the second student doesn't? Repeat that one more time. What's the probability that the first student studies history and the second one doesn't? That's all right. So this is sneaky. This is sneaky because I'm giving this all to you under the heading of conditional probability, right? You guys know that one of the big challenges, just put your pens down for a second. One of the big challenges for students when they meet the HSC versus when they are doing all of the tests, all the ATs and APs that you're doing in school, is that in the HSC, we do not tell you hey, this question is a conditional probability question, right? Or this question is a trigonometry question. You kind of have to work it out. Now, sometimes it's super obvious when they give you a Venn diagram, right? But as you start to get a little finer into the ideas, it starts to become trickier. It's a whole separate skill working out what the question is about and then solving the question. There's like two stages, right? Is this question a conditional probability question at all? It's not. That's so interesting. Because so many of you are like quick to shake your head, but you didn't give me a thumbs up. OK, that's fine, right? How do I know there's no condition? How do I know there's no condition? There's no conditional probability. I'll read the question for you one more time. Uh, what is the probability that the first student studies history and the second student does not? We're using the total sample space? We are using the total sample space. I'm going to use all 40, right? A way that you can know we use the whole total spa sample space is, you know how when we did um, this, or when we did this, what did I use to reduce the sample space? Condition. Some condition, right? There's no like, you know this about this student, you know this about the other. You don't know anything. So it's not a conditional situation. That makes sense? So all I'm going to write is, was it uh, first one studies history? History. No history. That's it. So I'm not using my, my bar to indicate a condition because there is no condition. Okay, great. This is actually just your typical, um, what's it called? Typical multi stage event. So I'm going to have each probability one at a time. Can someone give me the first one? 20 over 40, which, as we mentioned before, you can of course write that as a half, but I actually think this is more informative, right? There's the first bit. When you have a multi stage event, do we, how do we combine those probabilities? You have two, do we add or do we multiply? Why do we multiply and not add? How do you remember that it's multiplication, not addition? Because this is correct, but I want to know why. Because sometimes you do add probabilities. We're going to do it later on. What do you reckon? It's a new stage. That is correct. Like technically, that's correct. But I also want to ask, like, but why is that the rule? Because <laughs> you're right. But why should the rule of a new stage be multiplication, not addition? Yeah. It's kind of like there's a slimmer chance of getting both. I like this logic. Let's think about this, right? In probability, we deal with lots of fractions. But the thing you know about all the probabilities is the smallest value is. Zero. Biggest value is? 
one, okay? And then everything else is in between. So when you multiply by fractions in that domain, fractions always get smaller, yeah? Of course, when you multiply by fractions, sometimes numbers get bigger, if it's a weirdo fraction, like six over five. But in this space, in this space, fractions are always making things smaller as you multiply, yes? When you add, probably these get bigger. So if I were to add these two together, I'd have a more likely event than just one of them on their own. That's not right. This is a less likely thing. That's the way you can remember for a multi-stage event. The next stage, you multiply, okay? Now, these are two different students. So my sample space is no longer 40. I mean, if you wanted to say conditions, kind of is, but not really, right? How many students am I choosing from now? 39. 39. Uh, we have a phrase for this, by the way. It starts with a W and an R. What do we call this? When, when you're not picking from all of them, one's missing now. Without, without replacement, right? Um, sometimes you will see just this phrase, right? We draw marbles out of a bag and we do not replace them. This question doesn't say it's without replacement. It just tells you the two students are different students. Can you see why that means the same thing? Like you can't pick the same student again, so you're not putting them back in the bag, okay? All right. What's the numerator? 19. Hmm. I love a good argument. Okay, now, we've got two common answers in the room. I'm hearing 20, I'm hearing 19. Let's look at what the question is asking and think about if we can work out which one it is. We've looked at history. There's 20 students out of the 40 who study history. Now I'm looking at no history. How many of those students are left? <laughs> this is great. We're clarifying the question and we still have no clarity on the answer. Let's go back, shall we? Let's look up here. Let's, use the, let's go back to the Venn diagram, okay? I love that we're getting this argument. All right, so we've picked out a student and we know that they study history. So which, which bucket are they in? Up here. They're in this group of 20, yeah? Do I know which part they're in? No, you don't, because all you know is that they were a history student. So far, so good. So these get taken out, right? These are the ones I'm not interested in because they all study history. So how many of them study not history? 13 plus 7, it's 20, okay? The diagram does the work for you. Done. I mean, you can calculate that, but I don't really care what the answer is. That's the part we needed. Make sense?